Thanks a lot. So uh, this talk will be about uh, quantum algorithms and also some classical algorithms that really come out from theoretical tools that have emerged within the quantum information community. And because of the quantum algorithm connection, I figure I, uh, I better start by giving a quick overview about quantum mechanics. My assumption is that in this room, it's kind of a broad group, and not everyone is especially familiar with quantum. So I decided I would try to teach quantum mechanics in three PowerPoint slides. <laughs> and that may sound like a joke, but when, you, when I really thought about this, um, I asked myself, is it really hard to teach quantum mechanics? And I think appropriately to the subject, the answer is actually kind of both yes and no at the same time. And uh, so a reason that quantum mechanics is not hard to teach is because mathematically, in its fundamentals, it's actually a fairly simple theory. The state space, uh, the state of a quantum system is just described by a big vector with many components. And the dynamics there is linear. You just take these vectors, you multiply them by some correspondingly large matrix, and that tells you what the state will be at the next time step. So in some sense, the mathematical basis couldn't possibly be uh, much simpler. On the other hand, yes, quantum mechanics is hard to um, understand, hard to teach, because it's physically, in terms of what it really means, it's very different from what we're used to in our everyday life. The whole um, <coughs> notion of what it means for a system to be in a certain state, how cause and effect sort of plays out, um, you know, how measurements uh, and observations relate to um, reality, it's really just quite different. And so if you really want to deeply understand quantum mechanics from a physical point of view, you kind of have to grapple with this and, and really, in a way, discard your entire classical worldview and rebuild something new from scratch which is very hard. And so I will um, respond to this um, uh, second challenge by just totally giving up. <laughs> I'll skip this part, and I'll tell you only about the vectors and matrices and how we can use this to design um, ways of computing things. So here's the, here are the vectors and matrices. So if you start by analogy from a classical system, if you had some computer that just had two bits, then to describe the state of your computer at a given moment in time, you just pick which of the four possible um, combinations of values of two bits the system is in. So for example, maybe it's 0, 1. That's the state of your computer. And then as it moves through time, it jumps between these different states. With a quantum computer with two quantum bits, or qubits as we call them for short, it's somewhat analogous. There's still four underlying possible states. But now, at a given time, for each of those possible states, you have a corresponding amplitude. It's a lot like if you had a probabilistic computer. For every possible state that the computer uh, could be in, maybe you have some corresponding probability associated to it. Um, the key difference here is that these um, amplitudes, as we call them, um, are numbers that can be um, positive or negative. They can also be complex, in fact. Uh, and they don't add up to 1. Their squares add up to 1. <clears throat> so, but you can think of it mostly by analogy with probability theory. And so we often write down these amplitudes in nice little column vectors uh, and a traditional letter to denote those with a sign. So OK, so that's kind of a very abstract definition of what quantum mechanics is about. But it's sort of disconnected from the world. What does it actually mean if something has an amplitude of, say, two-thirds. Well, one thing that it means is that when you measure the system, your probability of getting a given outcome is given by the square of that amplitude, the absolute square if it's complex. And so one thing that can happen when you take these amplitudes that are all positive and negative and adding up together and then squaring to get a probability is that you can have interference patterns. Sometimes you can have positive and, or, and negative amplitudes adding up and canceling out. Other times, you can have positives adding together or negatives adding together and building up, very much as waves can either cancel out or add together. And this is no um, coincidence. Uh, certainly, uh, when you're shooting photons through some uh, grating and you get interference patterns, uh, that is fundamentally a process that 
you would need to describe um, ultimately with quantum mechanics. So that's one of the key things. A, a key difference between um, uh, optics and um, uh, quantum mechanics is that here these amplitudes are moving around in a much higher dimensional space, not just three dimensions, but two to the n dimensions if you have n uh, degrees of freedom. So it's kind of like optics, but in higher dimensional space. It's kind of like probability, except you add interference patterns. So it's kind of like if you take optics and probability, and these are two good sources of analogies that can lead you towards understanding uh, some of the ideas behind quantum mechanics. So um, what this uh, um, interference patterns can sometimes give you is ways to design your computation so that ultimately at the end the amplitudes onto wrong answers will cancel out and the amplitudes onto the correct answer will add constructively and it will solve some problem for you. And this can ultimately make um, a huge difference. So as you recall, if you um, uh, have n qubits, these vectors are 2 to the n dimensional vectors. So you'd have to write 2 to the n numbers to store the vector on your uh, classical computer's memory if you're trying to s simulate the quantum computer with a classical computer directly. And that gets very hard very fast. If you only have 10 or 20 or even 30 qubits, you can do this on just sort of ordinary computers that you might have in your pocket. But already by the time you get to 70 qubits, this is beyond the capacity of present day supercomputers. And by the time you get to 260 qubits, you're talking about more amplitudes than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So we're really not going to uh, build a computer that big ever. So, and that's not many qubits. That's less than a you know, less than a kil quantum kilobyte of memory. So already with some small quantum computers, you might be able to do some very interesting things. So OK, so that's mostly a statement about the state space that quantum uh, computers operate in. But what are you really doing? So you may have heard of a um, famous thought experiment where you put a cat into a box, and it's uh, a closed box. You can't see inside it. You have uh, apparatus arranged so that some radioactive decay, which happens in some superposition of some amplitude to happen, some amplitude to not happen, causes the cat to get uh, killed or not. And so now, if you extrapolate uh, the linear dynamics of quantum mechanics, you have the cat is in some amplitude to be dead and some amplitude to be alive at the same time. But of course, we know that in our everyday life, these kind of superpositions and interference effects are not actually observed. Like you don't walk down the street and like diffract around some telephone pole or something. So, so why is that? Why is this in, present there in the formalism of quantum mechanics yet we don't see it in our everyday life? And one reason for that is that these superpositions are very fragile. They get collapsed if something measures um, the state of the system. And it doesn't have to be a measurement that a person does. All it really needs to be is some other thing in the universe is carrying some record of what um, state the system is. It just has to carry off that information. So if you had some cat in the box, if one photon went there where if the cat was dead, the photon passes through, the cat's alive, it gets absorbed, that's already enough. Or some air molecule bounces off. So as you can see, it's really hard to maintain these superpositions. You have to isolate your system extremely well, which essentially no system in everyday life uh, at macroscopic scales is that well isolated. And so that's one reason why um, building quantum computers is so difficult. You really need to isolate your qubits uh, very well. But if you can, there's a big potential payoff, because with n qubits, you can be in these superpositions of many different states at the same time. And in some sense, you can do a superposition of exponentially many computations at the same time. And so this leads, uh, it, a lot, in a lot of these sort of less careful uh, expositions of quantum computing that you'll see in, say, um, science magazines or newspapers, popular press, they say, oh, well, basically, 
a quantum computer is exponential parallelism. It's like, it's like having a parallel computer with two to the n processors. But that's really not quite right. It's a somewhat misleading statement because if you had two to the n parallel processors, you would be able to extract the data from all of them at the end. Here, you do some measurement at the end, and you learn the outcome from only one of these um, possible computations. And so you have to engineer very, things very carefully to make sure that when you do this measurement, you're learning something that's actually useful rather than just, say, some random uh, sampling from this gigantic space of computations. You want to learn some global property of them. So that's really one of the most common myths of, um, <coughs> about quantum computing that I'd like to dispel a little bit. It's not the same as having exponentially many processors. In reality, um, you do get exponential speed ups, as far as we can tell, for certain problems. Two famous examples are sort of simulating chemical reactions and um, factoring um, large integers. But for other problems, um, you may get no speed up at all. So in fact, one uh, pretty old paper specifically busting this myth was a very famous uh, paper showing that for brute force search type problems, you don't get an exponential speed up. You only get a quadratic speed up at most. And interestingly, um, shortly after this paper came out showing that you can't get better than a quadratic speed up, there was a subsequent paper that you can actually achieve that quadratic speed up, which was discovered by uh, Love Grover, who at the time was at uh, Bell Labs. And this is um, a modest speed up compared to some of the other quantum algorithms, not exponential, just quadratic. But on the other hand, it's quite widely applicable. So you have um, uh, you know, any algorithm that at its core is somewhere using brute force search, you can speed that up quadratically. And of course, around the same time, as many have heard, one of the other uh, most famous quantum algorithms discovered was Shor's algorithm for factoring uh, large integers almost exponentially faster than what's possible classically. And here's Peter Shor shortly thereafter uh, looking very proud, as, as well he should. OK, so um, this, I think, leads to the second most common myth about quantum computing, which is almost the exact opposite of the first one which uh, is that quantum computers are only good for two things, factoring and searching. Grover's algorithm and Shor's algorithm are the only ones out there, and no progress has been made since 1996. But this is also not true. There's a lot of other um, quantum speedups known. I would say it's still the case that problems for which um, uh, quantum computing is known to offer an advantage are sort of a sparse set within problem space in some sense, is, is my feeling about it. But on the other hand, it's not just two. There are dozens of these things. And these include um, simulation of chemistry, as I've mentioned, which ironically historically comes before the discovery of uh, Shor's and Grover's algorithm. And there's some present day research into uh, quantum algorithms for optimization, scientific computing, machine learning. This talk will really talk about optimization. So this is another busted myth. And I do my part to bust this myth. I maintain a um, website called the Quantum Algorithm Zoo, which uh, attempts to keep a uh, comprehensive reference on all the, the papers and all the results in um, quantum algorithms. Uh, OK, so optimization. As I've described quantum computing so far, I've given it a very central role to interference effects. And this is one of the key elements you find in quantum physics. But another key phenomenon that you may have seen in a physics class is something called tunneling. So um, what tunneling is, is suppose you have some energy landscape like this. For example, it's some energy as a function of just one dimension, like if you built some kind of ramp. If you had some little marble that was rolling along this ramp, if it doesn't have enough energy to make it over this hill, it's just stuck there. A quantum uh, mechanical system, if it only has enough energy to oscillate around like this, it nevertheless has some non-zero probability of eventually kind of popping out to the other side and ending up at the bottom of this potential well. And that's called tunneling. You can kind of picture it like digging a tunnel through a hill. And so people had the idea, specifically um, one of the key early papers on this was by uh, Eddie Farhi. People had the idea that perhaps this would be advantageous 
in non-convex optimization problems. Maybe you have some cost function as a function of many variables. You can't just use gradient descent because there are lots of little uh, traps like this one. Maybe quantum tunneling can escape you from those traps and solve these optimization problems more quickly. That was the proposal. And in fact, in sort of simple kind of idealized mathematical examples that you can construct and analyze uh, on pencil and paper, you can show um, these advantages. You can prove them over certain competing uh, classical algorithms like simulated annealing. But these are very suggestive results but leave major questions. And two of those questions are, well, first of all, is simulated annealing the right thing to be competing against? Are there better classical algorithms that we could compete against? And secondly, um, although these nice uh, exactly solvable models are very instructive, what happens when you apply these um, algorithms to more complex real world cases? So these are kind of like the two um, central questions underlying this whole um, talk. OK. And one of the other interesting things about these tunneling based quantum algorithms is that they might be in some ways easier to implement than things like Shor's algorithm for factoring, for example. Um, there has been, there's a specifically a um, company um, out in Vancouver, uh, Canada, which is developing hardware specifically just to do uh, optimization by taking advantage of tunneling effects. This is called D-Wave. And uh, they're a somewhat uh, polarizing topic at physics conferences. They've, but they have raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital and built some sophisticated um, pieces of machinery. And um, they have also done some benchmarking of this machine against some popular um, optimization packages that you can get off the shelf, like Cplex and Garobi. Um, and sometimes they um, can demonstrate that they beat these packages on certain problems. So um, <coughs> this is kind of um, interesting. But on the other hand, it still leaves these very fundamental questions of, are we competing against the right classical algorithms? How does this scale? Can we find a firm uh, theoretical foundation for asserting that there really is or really is not a quantum speed up here? And one of the, um, I think, key points behind the uncertainty uh, regarding these D-wave style quantum annealers, as they're called, is that they don't directly take advantage of any interference effects. So interference is something where this is kind of, in some sense, the underlying ingredient behind things like Shor's algorithm. And there's, I think, fairly good reasons to believe that interference effects in exponentially high dimensional wave propagation cannot, in general, be mimicked by any classical algorithms. I think there's good evidence for that. On the other hand, in a D-wave machine, you don't have interference. All the amplitudes are actually positive. And so this raises a question like, OK, now you have this thing that looks really a lot like a probability distribution. It's all positive numbers. There are exponentially many of them. Could you just find some kind of probabilistic model, some Monte Carlo method to directly simulate this? Is it really doing something that you can't do classically? So tunneling, it's also a quantum effect. It's, you can distinguish it from thermally jumping over um, obstacles in um, a simulated annealing algorithm. But is it truly impossible to mimic this classically? That's actually. Uh, still an open question. So to get a little bit deeper into that question, <coughs> um, uh, we can look at Schrodinger's equation. So if, uh, if you like this kind of thing, you'll uh, like this slide. And if you don't like this kind of thing, you can just uh, close your eyes for two minutes. And the next slides are a little bit more practical. But um, Schrodinger's equation describes the dynamics of a quantum system, and it's just actually a quite simple looking equation. It's first order in time. It's linear. This, remember, this psi vector is just some big vector. This h is just some big matrix. And it's called the Hamiltonian. That's the name of this matrix. The dimension for cube, n qubits, the dimension of this vector is 2 to the n by 2 to the n. Uh, sorry, this matrix is 2 to the n by 2 to the n. This vector is 2 to the n dimensional. So 
once n gets beyond 50 or so, you can't store this vector in memory on your classical computer to simulate the dynamics of your quantum system. But maybe you could just inhabit it as a probability distribution. There's no problem of simulating a system of 50 uh, coins being flipped. You don't have to write down all 2 to the 50 probabilities in the memory of your computer. You just draw some pseudo-random numbers and inhabit that um, probability distribution natively as what it really is. And so the question is, could you do that to simulate these Schrodinger dynamics of something like a D-wave machine? In general, you can't because you have negative amplitudes. But if you have only positive amplitudes in a D-wave machine, there's some question, can you, can you mimic that stochastically or not? And in fact, if you go down the hallway to the physics department and you ask your um, local physics professor, oh, can you simulate these uh, systems where there's no um, negative amplitudes? The most common response you get is the happy physicist face. And sure, there's no sign problem. And so if there's really no sign problem and the physicist can just do this with their laptop, then maybe these uh, D-Wave people and the venture capitalists who invest in them should be very scared. So they think this, this conflict between this, these two intuitions of this being a very uh, valuable machine and this being something that we know how to simulate on our laptop is something that's worth digging into. So you can formulate this in complexity theoretic language and make a precise definition around it. Um, you may have heard of the P versus NP problem, where you try to prove which kinds of problems can be solved in polynomial time by different models of computation. Here you have another similar type of problem, which is the BQP versus stochastic P problem. Not um, quite as nicely named as P versus NP. But uh, the nice thing about this problem is it may, in fact, be within reach in contrast to P versus NP, which is probably, my guess is, uh, not within reach of presently known mathematical techniques. This might be something that we can do if we think carefully enough. <clears throat> so there is, um, so you can have these definitions. P is the set of problems you can solve in polynomial time on a classical computer. BQP is the set of problems you can solve in polynomial time on a universal quantum computer, things like Shor's factoring algorithm. Stochastic P is the polynomial time solvable things using this class of Hamiltonians that D-Wave machines, D-Wave machines and related hardware uses where there's only positive amplitudes. And there's actually good complexity theoretic evidence that um, uh, Let's see. Did I write this correctly? Um, no, sorry. It should be there's good evidence that stochastic P is not equal to BQP unless BQP is equal is contained in post BPP, which is generally thought to not be true. So it's probably, there's good reasons to believe that um, uh, BQP at stochastic quantum computers are less powerful than general purpose quantum computers. But the remaining possibilities are that they're intermediate in power between universal quantum computers and ordinary classical computers, or that they're no more powerful than ordinary classical computers. So sorry, this is, that should be a not equal to sign rather than a not contained in sign. OK. So, how might we address this kind of complexity theoretic question? So the easier direction to prove is probably in the case that these things are equal. Because if you want to prove that these computers are no more powerful than classical ones, you just have to find a classical algorithm that can efficiently simulate them and prove that that algorithm is efficient, that it always converges efficiently. And so you don't have to necessarily start from scratch to come up with these algorithms. You can ask the physicists down the hall, um, OK, what is it that causes you to think that you can solve this efficiently on your laptop? What method would you use? And really, you'll generally get two answers there. The most common answer is, well, we can use path integral Monte Carlo. That's what they use in practice, oftentimes, for simulating these kind of things. And maybe the second most common is something called diffusion Monte Carlo. I'm kind of lumping to the people who are actual 
um, computational physicists. When I say diffusional Monte, diffusion Monte Carlo, I'm kind of lumping together several things, including Green's function Monte Carlo, uh, but basically these kind, the, the, that style of algorithm. <coughs> so, um, so the obvious proof technique to show that these stochastic computers, like the D-Wave machine, could be efficiently simulated classically would be to look in these algorithms, analyze them, and prove that they always converge in polynomial time. And so what are these algorithms? So in the first one, path integral Monte Carlo, what you do is, if you're familiar with simulated annealing, what you have is some kind of little random walker, which is hopping around on the energy landscape. And you have some rules for how it hops around. And it preferentially goes downhill, but sometimes it can also go uphill with some probability. So it generally drifts in the right direction towards lower energy states that you're trying to find. But if it is getting stuck in some local minimum, it has some possibility of escaping by making these uphill hops. That's, that's simulated annealing. In Path integral Monte Carlo, instead of a single walker, in some sense, you have something that looks like a chain of walkers all hooked together. And they influence each other. And they're all sort of hopping around and making these tangled, um, tangled paths. This is not necessarily the way a physicist would describe it, but it gives some flavor of what these algorithms look like. And it, you can kind of see why this would be a good way of finding low energy states, because um, when a walker starts to find some more promising region of search space to look into that has lower energy, it will drag some of its neighbors along with it and sort of redeploy more of the computational resources to exploring more extensively in that region of space. Another interesting thing about path integral Monte Carlo is when you have simple landscapes with only a pair of wells, you can prove that the asymptotic uh, scaling of the amount of time that the walkers will take to um, converge to the um, lower energy well is the same as the scaling of the tunneling time quantum mechanically. And so that is sort of a promising sign in favor of using path integral Monte Carlo to achieve these speed ups for optimization. And um, so you can basically analyze these tunneling times. You'll have walkers spending preferentially more time in the bottom of the wells and preferentially less time in this barrier between them. And when you work out the math, it matches the um, uh, behavior of the quantum system. You use an analysis tool called instantons. Yes, yeah, so, well, so this, this, right, so this is not one walk. So you'd have, you could think of it as like each of these vertices on this kind of like zigzag line is a separate walker. And over time, you could have them all sort of wiggling around like some uh, worm that's. One point in time, multiple walkers. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, there's a little bit of a weird thing about the word time in this context. Because like, if you look at this direction, you think about what it corresponds to in the physics of the system. It corresponds to if you take the time variable and make it imaginary instead of real, which is a bit weird. But if you look at time like the computer is going from step to step, you have at each step you have this whole wiggly worm and it's wiggling uh, from time step to time step. So these two different notions of time, the computer's actual time and the time that you're uh, mimicking from the physical system are, are different from each other, which is a little weird. Um, so all of that was sort of pointing in the direction of maybe path integral Monte Carlo can always sim efficiently um, simulate the stochastic computers. But um, in 2013, um, uh, another person from uh, Microsoft uh, Quantum Group found a, was able to construct a counterexample where he could prove that path integral Monte Carlo will actually take exponential time to converge despite the absence of a sign problem. So it doesn't actually always uh, give you an efficient simulation for these stochastic machines. And so that is, if you look at the counterexample, it's a very weird kind of contrived energy landscape that he built just to be able to make a counterexample. But what this does is it sort of blocks that off as a proof technique. Like, OK, you're not going to be able to prove that p equals stochastic p by proving convergence of 
of Pathanur Monte Carlo. And so that uh, instead of the physicist giving a happy face, perhaps the founder of uh, D-Wave would be making the happy face this time. Um, so, yes. Yes, so the fitness landscapes that are really of interest for these kind of algorithms are ones with lots of local minima and with lots of variables. So I've drawn like a, the fitness is a function of two variables here, because we have the height as a function of x and y. Really, you might have 100 or 1,000, but I used two for obvious reasons. What's that? Um, Ah, so the counterexample, let's see, uh, yes, the way the counterexample works is Matt Hastings designed some um, landscapes that sort of are shaped like, a, like the um, sort of sombrero shape so that you can have some, uh, if the center is high enough, it's very hard for this, this string to go, to follow trajectories that go over the top. So basically it's stuck kind of winding around the bottom. And he can show that this winding number, if the system is equilibrated at the beginning is one value, and at the end, when it's found its optimum, that winding number is different. So how does it get there if it can't flip over the top? So fundamentally, it's kind of a topological barrier where these, these worms sort of get tangled around themselves and stuck. And so, um, so OK, so if that proof technique has been ruled out, then the obvious uh, idea, which you might be able to guess already from my prior slide, is like, OK, that rules out pathological Monte Carlo, the most popular method. Let's switch to the second most popular method, diffusion Monte Carlo. And this is a very different style of algorithm. It doesn't have these kind of worms that are wiggling around. It just has a population of little walkers. And they obey some kind of dynamics, which is partly diffusive, and partly, um, basically what happens is in more promising parts of the search space where the energy is lower, they may get to reproduce and multiply. And in more barren parts of the search space where the energy is higher, they start to die off. So as a dynamical system, it might be reminiscent of some like simple kind of uh, toy model of like the population dynamics of a bunch of bacteria sort of diffusing around. and, and uh, flourishing in areas with more nutrients and kind of dying off in areas with fewer. And the intuition for why this is uh, good for optimization is somewhat similar to the intuition behind um, uh, Pathological Monte Carlo, which is that you have these walkers. They're exploring this search space. Each time you evaluate the cost function, that's some computational um, work that you have to do. And so you want to spend more of your effort um, exploring the regions that are more promising, that have lower energies. On the other hand, you don't want to just totally concentrate your effort there, because then you might miss out on something that is a, a little bit more hidden. So you have this dynamic of walkers, where if some walker stumbles onto a promising region of uh, the space, it will start to thrive, and more of the population is redeployed to search that part of the space. And one thing you'll notice is that there's, n there's not going to be any topological barriers here. These are separate walkers. They're not tied together in some chain. You're not going to have the same problems that you have that Matt Hastings pointed out with Path Integral Monte Carlo. <clears throat> and the specifics of this walk, I mean, it's easy to say, OK, let's have some dynamics that's vaguely of this bacterial style. In this case, it's designed as a simulation algorithm. So you choose your probabilities for the walkers to die off and multiply according to very specific formulas, which ensure that in the limit where you run this algorithm infinitely long, the probability distribution of these walkers will converge to something which is proportional to these ground state amplitudes of your quantum Hamiltonian. And you can, um, with this style of algorithm, you can get things that look quite similar to um, tunneling effects in quantum mechanics. Here's a little computer simulation we did where we have a um, uh, energy landscape that just looks like a ramp with a little bump in it. And eventually, here's some probability distribution over walkers. Eventually, they find their way across the bump. And when one of them, do, one of them does, the other ones very quickly start to uh, basically teleport across here. These ones 
kind of die off very quickly and this population explodes. So it eventually tunnels across this barrier. So that looks promising. Can we actually prove it? Does this allow us to prove that P is equal to stochastic P, that these um, uh, quantum annealers can't achieve exponential speed up? Well, it turns out the answer is no. Um, with some co-authors, uh, I proved that, in fact, you can construct some counterexamples where this also fails to converge, um, basically due to the fact that this probability distribution is proportional to the amplitude itself, whereas the quantum probability distribution is proportional to the square of the amplitude. And in high dimensional spaces, this can actually make a big difference. And you can get exponential separations between the behavior of these things if you in your cost function, your energy landscape just right. Um, so both of the most obvious proof techniques for showing that these computers can be simulated classically fall flat. And so that um, is, uh, in a way, you could view that as a negative or positive result, depending on whether you're someone who builds these computers and sells them for $10 million a piece versus whether you're someone who is eager to prove uh, theorems. But there was another sort of side question that we tacked on as sort of an afterthought to this uh, uh, project, which is, well, OK, we've got these counterexamples. We don't have a proof technique coming out of here. But the counterexamples are pretty contrived. They're weird. They don't look like the examples of optimization problems you find in real life. Can, why don't we just try coding it up and trying it on some real problems and see what happens? So um, what we did was we just uh, um, Actually, this was a suggestion to, to try it on benchmarks uh, from my uh, former PhD advisor, Eddie Farhi. And so we just kind of typed into uh, Google, like, oh, benchmarks of MaxSat. That seems to be one of the most standard and well-studied uh, discrete optimization problems. The thing that popped up as the first hit was a set of benchmarking problems that turned out to be from a annual contest for MaxSat solvers, where people enter their software and win a little prize if their software solves this uh, fastest and best. And uh, so we uh, tried our algorithm on some benchmarking instance we downloaded from there. And what we noticed was that actually our algorithm solved this particular instance faster than the winning uh, entry from the previous year's uh, contest. So then we decided, hey, you know what? Maybe this is actually like far more interesting than our theorem proving project that we were originally pursuing. Let's just totally take a left turn on this project and say, OK, now our project is about this heuristic optimizer that we can try applying to these very disordered problems like MaxSet. And in fact, one thing we decided to do is enter a, uh, our software in the contest uh, the next year. Um, and so we uh, did so. And it turns out that we did not actually end up as the championship uh, software. That first instance that we chose was sort of a lucky choice. We performed pretty respectably in certain categories. We solved in the fastest. And we were beating uh, much of the uh, pack, many of the software that had been optimized over many um, years entering this contest over and over again. So we were fairly pleased with ourselves. It turns out that that year, the number one software that vastly beat everyone else was also written by a physicist, someone who was at the time a professor at Texas A&M, a guy named uh, Helmut uh, Katzgraber. And essentially what had happened is he had had roughly the same uh, observation at about the same time that we had uh, independently, and he did a better job of coding it up. And his software came in and basically leapfrogged all these other methods that people had been honing for many years. And this created quite a splash in the um, optimization community, just some weird physicist coming out of nowhere no one had met before and entering this contest for the first time ever and beating the pants off of everybody. So this was uh, um, not quite a win for me personally, but a huge win for what we now refer to as quantum-inspired optimization. This is, this is what we decided to call this subject. And so um, these are some uh, 
<coughs> benchmarking instances, which are widely studied um, by academics because they capture some relevant features of real world optimization problems that arise in industry. But they're a little bit simplified and idealized so that they're easier to work with, easier to analyze. So um, we became curious about how our algorithms would fare if we uh, applied them to some real world applications. And um, not coincidentally, um, I'm now at Microsoft. I, at the time, I was at NIST slash University of Maryland. Helmut Katzgraber was at the time a professor at Texas A&M. He's now uh, in the office uh, across the hall from me at Microsoft. My co-author uh, on this uh, and co both of the code and the paper on this thing is now also in, at the other end of the hallway at Microsoft. And we have a little group there which pursues this and applies it to um, industrial problems that we can get our hands on. <coughs> so um, I have a few examples of that. So one of the uh, examples that we've looked at is a problem of traffic optimization, something that uh, we in Seattle uh, uh, probably care about very much. And um, so this example is for the city of uh, Beijing. And this was something where prior methods that were being used to solve it were running in um, 800 seconds on a supercomputer. And on the D-Wave machine, they were able to get some uh, 40x speed up running this in 20 seconds, so a good improvement. But it turns out that using our quantum-inspired optimization methods, we could solve this in uh, one-fifth of a second um, using these QIO methods. And in fact, that's on a CPU. This is just you know, an ordinary workstation. If we run it on a special hardware, an FPGA, uh, in which, of which there are many in, uh, in Microsoft Azure's uh, cloud data centers, these are basically kind of like custom chips, but they're reconfigurable. We can solve this in only um, 0.0004 seconds. So we can get huge speed ups. Uh, by combining these quantum-inspired methods with more specialized classical hardware. <coughs> so um, one of the projects that uh, I'm currently working on, which is a little bit um, less industrial and more of a sort of researchy project, is we have a collaboration um, which is between uh, Microsoft and Case Western Reserve University, um, specifically the research group of um, Mark Griswold, where what we're optimizing in this case is um, pulse sequences for magnetic resonance imaging machines. And so these are very difficult things to optimize. So remember I said that we're looking for optimization problems that are in a very high dimensional space. This is a good example of that. And so you have these many, many parameters to choose from. They're all kind of coupled together. And um, what you want to do is choose these parameters to make your scan run faster or get better distinguishability between different tissues, for example, tumor versus healthy brain cells. And uh, so we have an ongoing collaboration where we use our software to generate new sequences and then test these out on volunteers in an actual, in fact, this is an actual picture of the, the apparatus that we test with. Um, and it's a tricky problem. There's, there's certain trade-offs between um, speed and accuracy. These are some of our uh, test runs on, on some volunteer from several months ago where we hadn't quite mastered this yet. And you can see like as we make shorter and shorter sequences to get quicker scans, the image quality gets worse and worse. So if you don't optimize things very carefully, you can quickly run into problems. And so you need some sophisticated algorithms here. Uh, and so this is a thing uh, that we have as ongoing work. So um, in general, we're always scanning around for um, kinds of problems we can apply these methods to. We have our little kind of um, applied quantum inspired optimization group. Uh, and so what are the things that tell us when to use these algorithms? Basically things we look for uh, are to achieve um, one of three things. We can either take some uh, fixed problem size and fixed quality of solution and try to achieve that quicker by the optimizer. So for example, if the problem is easy enough that you can find the global optimum, you're not going to improve on that. It's mathematically impossible. But maybe you could find a method that 
solves it in five seconds instead of in five hours or something like this you know, traffic optimization example. A different kind of thing is if it's a very hard problem where you can basically it's sort of hopeless to find the global optimum, you could say, all right, we have a fixed amount of computational resources we're willing to throw at this. Can we find a deeper optimum? This is more like the brain scanning uh, example. And a different kind of thing is, well, maybe it's neither of those. Maybe what you're doing in practice is solving a mathematical model that's quite simplified to reduce the number of variables and make it amenable to your current algorithms. And what we can do if we have a better algorithm is solve a, optimize a more realistic uh, model where we include more of the variables to be optimized. So any of these things are potential targets. And the other thing uh, that we look for is we need it to be the right kind of energy landscape. If you have some energy landscape that's just one sort of smooth basin, you don't need anything fancy like quantum inspired optimization or even simulated annealing. You can just use gradient descent or perhaps something slightly more sophisticated like conjugate gradient method. You'll slide right down to the bottom, no problem. On the other hand, if you have some optimization landscape that's completely random, then every time you take a query of this function, you learn nothing other than the value at that point. So no amount of cleverness is going to get you around that kind of information theoretic 